David is a leader in the individuals with learning differences community. At a young age, David was diagnosed with dyslexia and ADHD, which caused him to struggle with his education. However, he beat the odds and did graduate from Brown University. He is the founder of a mentorship program called Ida I National, uh, which is run by people with learning differences and ADHD. He also has a book called Thinking Differently, which is an inspiring guide to parents uh, who have children with learning disabilities. You, while you were at Brown University, uh, you started and founded uh, the Eye to Eye National Mentorship Program, uh, which is a mentorship program um, run and for people with um, learning disabilities and uh, ADHD. Can you tell us a little bit uh, more about the program? Yeah, um, I guess it's probably good to start where all stories should begin at the very beginning. Um, and I should be honest in that I didn't have a vision for creating the program that it is today. And I'll explain kind of what I mean by that. So um, I went to Brown, I'm 40 years old. So I got there in 1998. And um, I think maybe somehow I misunderstood the message being fed to us in that generation. But I thought I wasn't supposed to talk about my learning disability. I really thought that like sort of getting accepted to college meant that I was like, oh, I had overcome it. And um, very quickly, I realized that by not talking about my learning disability, I probably wouldn't succeed in college. I had asked one of my roommates to proofread a paper for me, and he did a horrible job of it. And then I learned that he was dyslexic. And I realized that like, I hadn't told him that I was dyslexic, so he didn't know why I was proofreading. And so all these kind of little clues were coming in. It helped me realize the best way to perhaps change my own experience in school, but also to change the next generation was to really start talking about my learning disability. Um, and, and over time, that became really embracing it as a part of my identity. And so I, I began without the real belief or understanding of what it would be today. Um, and I think those seeds matter. So it was me and a, and a handful of other people that started mentoring some kids who learned and thought like we did. We'd go into a local elementary school and tell them our story and hope that made a difference. And as we did that over really four years with a lot of other people, we started to understand actually we as people who had a story to tell could create great change, but what kids needed were some very specific things. And we figured out these things by figuring out how we had succeeded. So first off, self-esteem. So feeling good enough about yourself that you could do the hard things. Secondly, you had to know how your mind worked. So metacognition. Um, thirdly was accommodations. The school system wasn't really built for kids to learn differently. That's okay, but if kids don't have accommodations, then they're not gonna succeed. And then finally, and probably most importantly, advocacy. If you can't ask for those accommodations, if you don't know how your mind works, um, then you'll never succeed. So I, I began um, as really just kind of like, what would, what would it look like if we hung out with some kids? And now, you know, 20 plus years later, we're a program that does a number of things, all with the understanding that we help kids build their self-confidence give them advocacy skills, teach them about their metacognition and teach them how to find accommodations. And so it's been a joy to be a part of this community. And I'm actually quite excited about the future, even though I know there are times, I'm sure through many of the interviews you've done where you, you hear a lot of the hard stories and, and then they're there. But um, I'm optimistic that we can create great change in, in the school system coming together. Absolutely. And are there, what do you um, envision for the future? I know we're in hard times with um, this pandemic, um, but what are some of your goals long stream? Um, I'm so glad you asked that question. It's worth noting, right? Like you're in your home, I'm in my home. This is weird. All of the kids that we serve are most likely in their home or some different version of education. And I think if we've learned anything in this pandemic, it's that those on the margins are getting um, are really the most affected. And that's certainly true of kids with learning disabilities. So I think first naming the absolute problem here, which is kids are getting less than they had before. There's less parental understanding. There's, although it's escalating because the parents are watching their kids struggle at home. Teacher understanding, um, the kids you know, are trying their best, the teachers are trying their best, but the whole landscape just shifted. Um, and community at large is trying to figure out how can we make these you know, puzzle pieces go together. So I think that's the problem we have. It's not a new problem, but the pandemic made, it, made the cracks all the more wide. Um, but what I'm optimistic about is that to create a more cohesive, um, functioning learning model, you know, and I think learning is made very complicated, but all it really is is knowledge here, 
student here, how can we make those things reach? And I know teachers, that's all they ever want is to pass on that knowledge. And that's all kids ever want. Um, so the good news is really understanding is a way in which we get there. And again, I come back to like my earliest lessons as a person with a learning disability. It's a little bit on us. It's this interview. It's helping people who've had this lived experience figure out a way to comfortably share their stories so that well-intentioned adults, whether it be parents or teachers, can better understand that. And the kids themselves can know there's nothing broken about them. And here at IDI, we've done a couple of things, even in the pandemic. Um, we offer free online resources. We call them LD101s. They're, some of those are for kids. Some of those are for um, educators. And it's just a way for you to go and learn about the experience of a person going through this moment and some tools to help them get through it. So there's a lot out there and I'm optimistic that we can really create some understanding in this time, even though there's a lot of hardship. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, what a lot of people are, you know, realizing and especially since it seems like, you know, it's already been six months, we're in September and seems like it's going to be another year, according to Anthony Fauci and just, you know, the um, administration and government. Uh, but I think what a lot of people are realizing is that they need to find kind of a new normalcy. So can you tell us a little bit um, or tell us a success story of an individual in your program? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to say one of the best parts of my job, especially over such a long period of time, is I get to see the true success stories. I think so many Times people just look at the challenges and they think, oh, how will this ever get better? I hear about so many kids who don't make it. I mean, the statistics are staggering, as I'm sure you know. Mm -hmm. um, kids who are LD are one of the most disenfranchised populations in our country. Um, and yet I do get to hear the incredible success stories. And, you know, the ones that I like the most are the ones where the mentee becomes a mentor. And now we've been around long enough where I've seen that happen. In fact, one of the stories I, I like to share is actually my mentee. So, um, the first student that I started working with, and I always think if this could work for him, it has to get better because I was like the worst mentor. I didn't know what I was doing. Um, so uh, one of the students, his name's Justin, that I, I started working with when I first met him, he was this really shy kid. He had been held back a couple of years. Um, he didn't know how he learned and he didn't really know what he was doing in school or why he was there except for um, just getting passed by. And by spending time with him, I helped him understand first, like, hey, you got a lot of gifts here. And I helped him figure out that his passions and the things he loves which at that time primarily lived outside the classroom, had translation inside the classroom and ultimately translated into the real world. And one of the things that he loved to do was cook. Um, even though he was, uh, you know, very young, he actually did most of the cooking in his family. Wow. And so as I taught him about, oh, well, you're good with your hands, um, you're very creative. I mean, those kind of skills translated to him learning well in school. And not only did he do so well in school, my favorite part of the story is years later, um, he uh, ended up going to culinary school and uh, it turned out the school he went to was actually located not far off from where the first eye to eye chapter existed. And he went back to the same school and mentored kids in those same classrooms. And we have lots of stories like that. And they make me happy because it reminds me that when you give somebody the gift of knowledge and give somebody the ability to light their heart on fire, um, they will not only do well for themselves, they'll keep giving back and they'll keep changing the world. And that's why I, I think it's ultimately been as successful as it has, has very little to do with me. And um, thankfully, it has a lot to do with the generosity that keeps on giving. Um, exponentially, people keep feeling more confident in their ability to change the world and do well. And young people um, have always done that in our history. And, and through the frame of disability, that's also true. Right. No, for sure. And for people actually watching this interview and maybe interested in um, mentoring, how do you get involved in the side? You go to I, I National um, the website, um, but is it an easy process? Is it like a difficult process? What is the process kind of like for this program? Yeah, you know, it's worth mentioning a couple of things that we do. So mentoring is just one of them, and, and I'll mention a bit about that. But um, there's some, some sort of easy lift things that you can do in the pandemic. So before you become a mentor, you need to help yourself. Um, so I, I offers a number of technological um, interventions. Um, so you could join our club, you could join our Facebook profile, where you can start conversations there. You can download our app, which is very much a, a, a tool for you. Um, also, uh, if you're a parent or a teacher, you can go and use some of our online resources that I mentioned um, so that you can get informed. Um, whether you sign up for one of our LD101s, you could buy my book, which is directed at parents. Um, so you go on our website, you can see about all these resources. And, and my point being, there is no wrong way to make a difference and no wrong way to start making change. And so the mentoring is certainly one of them. 
um, during this pandemic, it's, it's hard to be a mentor um, because so much of mentoring is about connection. Um, but indeed, you can become a mentor. You can come and get trained. trained. You can go on our website, get our curriculum and all of that. But um, that's a bit more involved of process. Totally fine. Um, in fact, that's kind of our bread and butter. But I think what we've learned in this time is do something. And so often I think people say, oh my gosh, like, it's, I just don't know where to start. And our job is to help be connectors. I always sort of say we are the chief invitation officers. And so uh, no matter what it is that you want to do, we're here to try and make that dream a reality and make the world a little bit better. But it starts with sharing your story. Absolutely, for sure. Uh, so clearly, as you've mentioned, you have a learning disability yourself. Uh, and so we'll get a little bit more into that. So you were diagnosed at a young age, specifically with dyslexia and uh, ADHD. Uh, how did all of that um, transpire into your difficulties within school. Um, ultimately, you did graduate from Brown University. Uh, and, you know, also, do you have any advice for um, students um, or parents um, who have children who are uh, struggling right now with learning disabilities? Yeah, you know, it wasn't an easy journey for me. And, um, you know, part of, a big part of my life's goal has been to make it easier for others. But I would be remiss to say that it's all smooth sailing. Um, you know, for me, the first time that I really came to understand that I had a learning disability, it wasn't done in community. And that alone was very hard. I think that there was a belief that we shouldn't tell anyone, um, that we should be, uh, you know, for lack of better words, shameful of this. And so I didn't tell anyone for years, and that was really, really hard. So just thinking about my own journey and how we can make things better, um, there's, Nothing, no, no bad thing is going to happen when you say out loud that you or your kid learns differently. Mm -hmm. In fact, it is quite normal. 20% of our population learns and thinks differently. So I think that that stigma is a big place to fight. Mm -hmm. um, kind of, it's kind of fighting your own maybe muscle memory. Um, if, it, if it lives in your family, I know it's genetic. So that's often where that comes from. I think a lot about, I later learned that my dad had ADHD. And um, so he had his own journey and his own feeling. So if you're a parent, you may need to like visit your educational journey before you go and help your kid. But I think the, the thing you can do if you're a kid is find community. You can find that virtually these days. That's where we have to look. But you can find it in your school. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yes, yeah, so I struggled a lot, uh, suffered from loneliness for lack of better words. Okay. And um, thankfully through uh, accommodations and through ultimately being able to tell my story, I did better in school. I didn't find what I would call my people quite yet though. Okay. Um, with, without saying that I had dyslexia, I certainly wouldn't have gotten the accommodations I needed. I wouldn't have gotten the support I needed in school. But it wasn't until college and really as a result of eye to eye that I found peers who learned differently. And that was helpful for me because what I learned is even if my um, LD brother or sister didn't um, quite do the same thing as I did to, to mm -hmm. succeed in school, we all were kind of doing things differently and doing things differently as a community made it feel that much more okay. Mm -hmm. And so I would argue that taking away the stigma, finding your community, and then ultimately the, the sort of third piece for me, for me being successful in school is mm -hmm. finding a passion. And my passion was in service. And so I was lucky that um, that translated ultimately as an adult into a life of service. Yeah. And um, I see a lot of our young people following the same path now. Yeah, no, I, I it's wonderful. And Clearly, as you know, I look up to you um, from somebody who struggles themselves and, you know, I know the journey and, you know, there's just like a, we brought up and, you know, we're talking about there's so much potential um, and change that is happening with leaders such as you and me too, but, you know, and, you know, room for growth. Um, sure. Well, this is the part where I have to say that I totally admire you and you are an example of the story we're talking about, right? You've taken your journey mm -hmm. and you've said, I'm not going to just let that sit on the shelf. You very easily could, right? But right, you've chosen yeah. to take that and make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a model for all of us. And, and, yeah. and I think for folks who are, you know, tuning in today, you don't have to do what I did or what you did, right? You right. just have to do what's right for you. Absolutely. And you can take little acts that can create huge ripples. Right. Um, which is, that's, you know, that's the amazing thing about a person's story. You're the only one who has it. So if you use it in a meaningful way, you're going to change the world. Absolutely. 
so what would you say to individuals um, who have doubted uh, your ability to graduate from college, um, let alone from an Ivy League school? You know, I have to say, you know, one of the things I think I personally have struggled with is casting judgment on anyone, right? And so my, my feeling is, if it, and I didn't really come across a lot of people who said to me directly, you're never gonna make it. I mean, there were certainly people in my youth who maybe tried to like temper my expectations. And I think that that was all done with love. Um, although it was, like you said, sort of misinformation. Um, but I think that the reality is our job as people is to not ever tell somebody else you can or can't do something. Each of us are going to try our best. Our job is to cheer each other on. That's what humanity's job is um, and to not place judgment. And if you find yourself wanting to place some judgment on someone, I would ask yourself to pause and say, where does that come from? Mm -hmm. why, why would I mean to place judgment on someone else's potential? And in terms of if you're having self-doubt, which, oh boy, do I get. I mean, I have self-doubt every day. Every day, it doesn't go away. I want people to know that. I think sometimes people look at the, oh. the you know, the folks who are maybe a little bit older and have, and have done a few things to say, oh, well, they got it all figured out. I haven't figured it out. I'm still haunted by self-doubt. Um, but my community is what gives me the energy and the belief to push forward. Challenges come in life. Of course. We're all living through it right now, huge challenges. But my belief that together we can make a difference is, is what helps me continue to get up in the morning every day. Yes, me too. Uh, well, so now what advice would you give to um, individuals who are transitioning into the workforce that have awareness? You know, I think that there are certainly some lessons you can take from school that translate to the workforce. So mm -hmm. if you were a good advocate for yourself in school, then you'll probably need to be a decent advocate for yourself in work. Mm -hmm. um, if you were able to talk about your learning disability in the context of school to get what you needed, same thing in work. Now, there are some differences, right? So one advantage I found transitioning from the school world to the work world, you know, school's graded. There's, there's a, a, you know, a whole, whole way in which it's all about you. Um, when you get to work, it's pass-fail. You either get your assignment done or you don't. Um, and one of the things I think I've learned, especially at I to I, where, you know, we're an organization run by and for people with LD. Mm -hmm. So, you know, being able to have an environment where everybody talks about their learning experience with the goal of, can we help you get your job done? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I'd name, not everybody at I to I is LD. The majority of us are. Um, but we have the same sensitivity across the entire board. Um, so whether you have an LD or not, we're just trying to figure out how can we best make it so that you can succeed? And I think that translates when you get your first job. Your employers hired you. They want you to succeed. Mm -hmm. Hiding behind what might be a real challenge isn't going to get you anywhere. So uh, I think there's a whole new set of uh, words that we're learning to use to inform our employers of what it means mm -hmm. uh, to get something done differently, but it still meet the deadline and to maybe exceed expectations. And that's a little different than school. Um, but again, this generation coming up, already has training in how to use their story. So just, you know, take that leap in the work world and we'll, we'll make some great change there too. Absolutely. And now what other um, resources, clearly besides eye to eye, um, can people find support, specifically those that are graduating college into going into the workforce? Yeah, you know, I wish there was more around the work world um, interventions um, than there is. Um, in fact, uh, there's a great reporter in Forbes um, who, uh, Deborah Brody, who's written a bunch about resources um, that, that I would recommend, you know, checking out. Um, there hasn't been a ton written about this. Um, and I think part of it is because it's our story to write. So mm -hmm. I could give you a whole list of places to look um, for school. Um, I definitely plug uh, understood.org, which you've probably come across, sure. uh, Mind Institute. Yeah, uh, you know, things like that. But I think the story of the work world is one we're about to write. Mm -hmm. I would agree. I'm yeah. And, and I think, again, like, it, it's all on us. And also, companies want us to succeed. I did a talk last week, a virtual talk. Uh, yeah, of course. That's what we have now. But like you said, it worked out quite well, because it's a global company. And one of our alumni worked there. And um, she started by saying in her community, hey, we're not talking about this enough. And she, you know, I think had done her time and was a rock star in the company. So she had a little social capital that she felt she could spin. 
in order to ultimately create a group for this, again, global company. And I just came in as an outsider to give some examples of ways in which uh, I have seen working differently, working effectively. And because she led within the company, she is starting to create a culture change. And people like us can come in as outsiders and make suggestions, but ultimately it takes people from within and it takes courage. Um, and sometimes you have to know your legal rights if you feel as though you're being you know, discriminated against. But I think that the, the, the discriminated against model is the wrong model. Let's look about what's right about people who learn differently. Um, and I think that there is so much goodness there in companies, especially because if you look at some of the statistics, at least in America, of Fortune 500 companies, 25% are led by people who have dyslexia. So there's sensitivity within these type of companies. You can look for those places. Um, but if you remain silent, then you're not actually, you know, moving things along. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people um, are silent. Um, it's not just with learning disabilities um, and, you know, mental health or so forth. Um, and it's unfortunate um, because, you know, it's better to be open and get the help than, you know, hide. Yeah. Uh, so what are your thoughts on the Americans with Disabilities Act? and accessibility that we have to date? So I think a lot about the ADA, um, you know, we just passed the 30th anniversary and um, obviously many of us were celebrating that moment. And I think that there was an awful lot to celebrate in that moment. Um, and yet I still feel that there is a lot of progress to be made. Um, I often think about this in terms of carrots and sticks, right? So um, what we have, um, in this moment is the ability to say, you know, we are, we are ensuring that we're gonna have a more equitable society, right? That's our goal. But what we aren't optimizing for in that moment is, you know, that individuals themselves can thrive. And so, you know, I think that it is great that we know that if we must, and we, and we have unfortunately had to, if you think about the history of the disability rights movement, actually write this down to say people who have disabilities cannot be discriminated against. But what we actually need to, to, to flip our brains on is to say, we're not just trying to make sure we're equitable. Let's make sure that every person can thrive. And so, you know, I wrote a piece around, um, around this time. We could probably throw it up in the link when this, um, when this goes live. And what I really tried to say was like, let's celebrate the progress we've made and let's imagine a future that's even better. And I think about it a lot in the pandemic. A lot of us say, gosh, can't wait for this pandemic to be over so we can get back to normal. I don't want to get back to normal. Normal wasn't as good as we thought it was. It's better than now, right? But let's use this time to get back to great. Let's find a way to go beyond normal. And um, we are finding opportunities in these cracks, as you're discussing even from the working standpoint. You know, I think about a lot of our employees having ADHD. Uh, mm -hmm. Is working at home good or bad for you in this? I to eye has revisited our own policies of what it means to be working effectively. I know for some people, working from home is much worse. Uh, maybe they have kids at home or it's more distracting, but for others, if you have ADHD, working at home might be better because you're less distracted by your coworkers or things. And there's not a right answer. The, the answer is analyzing it. And so, you know, I think that there's progress to be made. And I think if we commit to that in this time, especially in the hard, we've learned that when things are hard, that's when great things can happen. So if we can commit to that in this time, then we can come back better than pre-pandemic. Absolutely. Yeah. And we're going to have a new world. Um, when this is all over, yes. whenever that may be. <laughs> uh, with what you know now, what would you have told yourself uh, 10, 20 years ago? 10 and 20 are pretty different. So I'll start with 20 and then I'll go to 10. And that's fine. Or just 20, it doesn't matter. Just well, the, yeah, I mean, the funny thing is, so, so, you know, 20 years ago, um, I was just coming out of college. Mm -hmm. And I think if I was, hopeful about what it, mean, what it meant for me as a person with a learning disability, um, I would have thought that accept, self-acceptance um, and living a modest life would have been enough. And when I say modest life, I mean that my dreams still really weren't that big because I had struggled, you know, for, for of those 20 years, most of it had been a struggle. And um, the 10 years following were some of the best years for me um, because I, you know, I was able to live a more legitimate life against my identity because I had really found community. And now I see, you know, kids who, especially those participating eye to eye, are so much further along than I was. And so when I think about like 10 years ago, 
you know, what am I hopeful for? I've seen a, a wave of change. I've seen young people telling their stories to their peers, but also on social media, which, you know, didn't exist 20 years ago. I've seen them using tools like we're using right now to make sure the community can come together and hear our stories. So, you know, I really feel that the wave of change that needs to happen is around understanding. All the things that I offers are essentially tools to make that understanding easier, better, faster. But um, I feel really optimistic that like, let's talk in 10 more years. And I think at minimum people will have a better understanding of what it means to learn differently. There'll be better acceptance of these differences. We'll be optimizing as we're discussing for the greatness of the different thinking brain. And we won't be you know, putting shame against those who do have struggle. Because frankly, whether you have the label or not, we all have struggle. And the thing about disability and mental health, everyone's gonna have, it's one of these few minority classes that everyone's gonna join at some point. The majority of people before they die end up finding a way into this group. So let's start with some love and acceptance of this group now um, and make some progress. Yeah, absolutely. The difference in our age yeah. was really focused on tools. Yeah. And a lot, you know, like lots of great tools came around, right? Mm -hmm. I struggle with reading with my dyslexia because I had to read with my eyes. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you did too. And mm -hmm. yet the generation coming up, just the 10 years after you, having, you know, I, I get all of my books right here. They're sent to me. They're in my pocket. My library sends them to me. They're audio. I can listen to them wherever, whenever. There's no judgment. And so the, like, I think our generation got a lot of tools. And the next generation is creating understanding. And that's the place where we have to do the work. Because we can have all the tools we want. But if they just sit on the shelf and we feel too ashamed to pick them up, we're still going to struggle. Absolutely. And actually, yeah, I totally agree. I mean, it's all tools and things that I've learned. Um, even over the years, and I worked with a neuropsychologist and learned so many strategies, cognitive remediation and all of that. Um, and, you know, obviously I use them in my day to day life. Um, but actually, even just talking about you specifically, so what tools do you use? You had mentioned you listen to audio tapes. Do you read, I mean, do you read anything that's, you know, print? No, I'm, ju I'm just curious. I mean, yeah. so I get, about, oh, I'm not because I get that question about. a lot. I'm not talking um, about Zoom, but no, I mean, it's reading yeah. difficult, you know, when you have dyslexia. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole range of tools that, um, that have changed for me over time because it's so context dependent, right? So depending on what I'm trying to read, um, I mean, I rarely read something that I'm picking up, but that's partly because I think most of us don't pick any, anything anymore, right? It's just easier to like download it in an electronic format on a device. Um, so most of the time, just strictly speaking about reading, I'm having a device read it to me. Um, the fact that like my computer syncs with my phone means that wherever I am, I'm reading. And so I think I've caught up on some lost time from my youth uh, mm -hmm. because those devices are everywhere and because everything that is written is essentially starting on a computer. No, not very often are you finding some handwritten manuscript that you have to like translate with your eyes. Um, I think the ADHD is a, is a maybe greater challenge because the world has gotten more distracting, not less. Um, certainly, you know, medication on and off over the years has been helpful, again, depending on context. Um, but also, I always come back to people, which is not a new tool, um, meaning working with each other. And that's the thing that I've had to do the most self-work on, helping others understand how to communicate with me, how they learn and think, and helping them figure out a way to understand how I learn and think. And that's frankly what we try and do in school. So I, it all circles back to like, even though I'm doing this in the workplace, I'm learning from our students. The success mm -hmm. stories we're hearing in our classroom come from this magic where teachers better understand what their kids need and kids feel comfortable asking for what they need. And that's all that we do at Eye to Eye. And honestly, like I always say, like I actually work for the students because I feel so lucky that I had the chance to learn this stuff mm -hmm. from them. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, just to reference, we're talking about being home and we're joking. I was just going to bring home. that up. Yeah. I mean, there's like a pretty decent chance one of my kids will run in here and they'll have some interesting things to say. And, and I love being home with them now. And maybe it's the one gift. So it's funny. I'm a trained educator who okay. fell into social entrepreneurship. Uh, and, you know, my daughter started kindergarten this year. Oh, she did. Okay. So there yeah. you go. And, um, and I'm pulling for dyslexic because I know there's some great things that come with that. Yeah. Um, and I know all kids have challenges and I'll I love them both either way. But it's been exciting to be able to frankly take everything that I learned from my students 
and from this community. And now to watch as a parent, like I, she's not mini me. She's, I'm thinking about Emma because, you know, starting her schooling, she's her own person. And I'm stepping into this role saying, how do you learn best? And I've been helping to facilitate her learning since I'm home. Um, obviously, she's got teachers who are doing a great job, too. Well, and of course, but, you know, if you're home and one of the parents, of course, you're going to help them, I mean, homework, yeah. whatever the case may be. Yeah, and um, I have sympathy for parents who are doing the same thing. Um, and I do think it's different whether you're talking about elementary, middle, or high school. Of course. I mean, the middle schoolers are the ones I'm most worried about because you think about what happens in middle school. You know, that's where actually you, you it's healthy if you start pushing away your parents a little bit. You're, you, you should be taking independence, and it's where your self-esteem is most important is where you start designing in your own brain, who are you, wh what do you wanna be, what do you like, what are your friends talking about? And to, to see kids, particularly kids who have learning disabilities who are more likely to experience depression or anxiety and to see them alone at home, um, even with loving, caring adults, you know, whether they be physically in the house, if, if, you're, if that's something you have, or at least virtually, you know, they're, they're still alone. And so eye to eye has tried very, very hard to make sure they do not feel alone and they feel understood by people who are actually not me, right? Like near peer relationships are super important. So finding people who are slightly younger, a little more accessible, um, sharing their stories with them and encouraging them to share their stories. I think that's how we're gonna get that this generation through it. Cause Absolutely. I'm very scared that they'll come out of this exceedingly traumatized if we don't do the right thing now. And I think it's also really important that you start young. Um, so when they're an adult, such as me, um, you know, they don't, you know, they learn the skills, they feel less alone, um, they have a sense of community, um, and, you know, kind of learn how to succeed despite their challenges. Um, because even though you and I have had that over the years, it's not something, I mean, we didn't have eye to eye or, you know, we didn't have what, you know, what there is today um, back X number of years ago. So. You wrote a book, uh, Thinking Differently, which is an inspiring guide for parents uh, with, or of children with learning disabilities. Can you tell us a little bit about the advice and what you discuss in the book? Yeah, the book was a real, I mean, I always think my name's on the cover, but it was a real collaborative effort. Okay. And, um, you know, the, the idea behind the book was we've learned a lot. This, this is funny talking about the years, right? So I was 30 mm -hmm. when I committed to writing the book. And I had just realized that I, I had existed for, a, for more than a decade at that point. And it was important to try and codify the lessons we had learned and at least put them down for families we couldn't reach immediately. Mm -hmm. And so as you go through the book, each chapter is dedicated to one of the different tools that we teach in IVA. Many of the things we've talked about today, putting those same tools in the hands of parents. So, you know, how do you find out what a good accommodation is? How can you be a learning detective to help your kids start to figure out how their brains work best? How can you practice self-advocacy skills and what does that even mean or look like? What is LD community and LD culture? So I go through the book and um, very much try and help put tools in the hands of primarily parents, but it turns out that teachers really like this book too. Um, because I think, again, they can reinforce the things that all of this comes back to being able to practice the skills that you need to succeed in life. If you only advocate for yourself once, you'll probably do a bad job of it and you may fail. But if every day you start figuring out how to ask for what you need in a kind way and you get what you need and then it reinforces, these are the type of things that allow you to succeed in life. And we tried to bundle all that in the book. And I'll tell you two things about it that surprised me. Um, one is initially when I had written the book, I thought I'd be more like a journalist. Mm -hmm. So I had sort of sat front and center and watched all these stories transpire. And I turned in my first draft and the editors came back to me and said, this is great, but you're telling people they need to share their story and you didn't share yours. You have to go back. And it was a real like aha moment for me. So I had to go back and essentially rewrite the whole book, including parts of my own journey in it. Um, the second piece about it that was interesting is uh, we, we talk about like, what is a modest life? Um, and I was super scared of writing a book because it involved words. And it certainly wasn't a goal of mine. And I, I kind of fell into deciding to write a book because I thought, well, there's some utility in that. Books can, you know, have knowledge and get to a lot of people really quickly. And all of my fears went away because I sat down with my editor. And um, interestingly, he had done tons of books from really brilliant people. He did Obama's first book. I mean, I was like really excited to have this guy as my editor. And, um, 
and he started to ask me what I needed and everything he was suggesting were things that he thought I needed as a dyslexic. So he thought I needed more people to help with proofreading. He was right, but it was the wrong type of people. He thought it was content. I was like, I got the content. You need like however many spell checkers you typically have, you need twice as many. Um, and like at the end, they wanted me to do the audio book. And I was like, no, 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 I write the books. I don't like to read the books. And so, you know, these little things that even in the process of writing the book, the very lessons I was writing into the book, I had to utilize to get the book done. And um, I've often thought about my second book being about the workplace, something like working differently. And I think I'll include some of the experiences writing that book as a beginning of it. Yeah. Um, because I think there's a lot in there just about what it means to work as an adult that comes right back. If you pay attention to your childhood, you can pull these things back into the work context. You have to repurpose them a little bit, but if you practice again and again and again, you'll succeed. I'm with you on that. I look forward to seeing that book being written. <laughs> yeah. For uh -oh. now, I'm glad. I'm surprised people have been reading Thinking Differently in the pandemic and said that it was useful. And of course, it's I wasn't great. It's a great book. for I a pandemic. Yet. Yeah, but I think some of the values of just using this time, especially to know yourself, your home. Yeah, so of course. You can use this time to learn a bit more about yourself and your interrelation to your family and your learning experience, and you can come out of it stronger. Oh, absolutely. Now, lastly, what advice would you give to um, parents or children with, disability, with a disability? And then also, what advice would you not give um, to a parent or a child? I always struggle with this question a little bit because I, while a parent, I haven't yet experienced directly what it might be right. to, um, you know, have a kid with a disability. But so I'm speaking a little bit from the vantage point of my own experience. As right. A, That's, as a, yeah. Yeah. And also, obviously, talking to at this point, thousands and thousands of parents. And maybe um, even your own parents. I mean, I don't know if that yeah. was even, you know. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think the thing I've learned is that parents need to. Um, sometimes just stop and listen to their kid. I think there's an instinct I know as a parent, I tend to have this instinct of wanting to parent my kid, right? My job, I, I will feel I've done a good job if I can produce a child that has good values, is a, in my opinion, a good citizen, you know, and, and lives a, a life that's meaningful to them. Um, but I can't put that into my child. The only way I can be a good parent is to actually listen to my child. And of course, there are different stages when that's possible. And so you're talking about a kid with a disability. Yes, you want to protect your child. Yes, you want to try and do everything you can. It is your natural instinct to do everything you can to support your kid. But the way you can do that sometimes is to actually ask them, how are you doing? What could I do to, to help you? There's a story that, um, probably the story that everyone repeats back to me from my book, it's actually, I ended up putting it on my website of a time when I was struggling with reading and my dad, instead of like telling me what to do, he just asked me for help. And I sort of snarkily said, well, why don't you read this book to me? I had like a micro tape recorder that I asked him to read this book to me because I didn't have the audio books at that time. It was a different time and it was like harder to get audio books. And he just did that. Mm -hmm. And not only did it give me the book that I needed to be able to listen to and do well in the class, it showed me that there was a person who had my back no matter what. So I think parents can ask, how can I help you? I think kids have to practice asking for what they need. Mm -hmm. And that's really hard too, because mm -hmm. sometimes they don't know what they need. And so sometimes a parent asks and the kid doesn't you know. So the kid has to do some work. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, again, this is where I, I tries to be of support because that parent to kid or that teacher to kid relationship it's all about communication and if we can help through lived experience make that communication a little smoother um, then we've done our job really well and um, and again I feel super optimistic that um, even during this time where I know in some homes tensions are higher because we're like living together we can take a beat sometimes if you live in a like studio apartment it may literally just be going to your corners of the room but take a beat and then just ask how can I help those few words can create game-changing moments in people's lives.